Today is October 18th, 2023, and my guest is Zach Wienersmith. This is Zach's third appearance on Econ Talk. He was last year in March of 2023 talking about his book, Beowulf. Our topic for today is his latest book, co-authored with his wife, Kelly, A City on Mars. Can we settle space? Should we settle space? And have we really thought this through? Zach, welcome back to Econ Talk. Excited to be here. Uh, it's a crazy book. Uh, it it is at times wildly funny. I I le- but I learned many things that I knew nothing about covering a wide array of topics, and I think like most people, I just sort of assume that sooner than later, and probably sooner, uh, we're going to populate space in some fashion. Uh, in your book. Um, brought me up short. Uh, It it certainly prepared me uh, to think about it in a much richer way. So why don't we start off with how you got started on the book? What was your goal? What were you you and Kelly trying to do? And how did your perception of space settlement change as you did the research and the writing? Yeah, so, excuse me, for our last book, uh, we did a book that was on emerging technologies. We had two chapters that were pertinent to space. And one was on asteroid mining, And one was on uh, cheap access to space. Asteroid mining, we were, I think, appropriately skeptical and have grown more skeptical of. uh, But cheap access to space actually happened uh, basically due to SpaceX and, and, you know, there were other factors. But the, the, the short version is SpaceX. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool to write a book about this thing people seem to be ignoring when we talk to them, which is what are the rules going to be? for this coming space expansion? Because we had this experience where we talked to asteroid mining people and be like, what's going to happen if someone mines a bunch of iron out of an asteroid and wants to throw it at Earth? And and to add a little flavor to that, imagine it's Vladimir Putin doing it. Like, what are the rules going to be for flinging a giant hunk of metal at Earth? And we, generally speaking, people didn't have a good answer. And I have, I have opinions on why they didn't have an answer now, but it was surprising. And so we thought we'd write a book about how this sort of thing ought to happen. And it just turned out the the, the sort of optimistic picture we'd been led to was basically wrong. And so in about two years into the research, the book went from here's how we're going to do this awesome thing to here's why we should slow down, why we have to and ought to slow down. And let's start with some of the myths, as you do in the book, that people have about this. Um, Somehow, if we travel into space, uh, we're going to be able to start the world anew, a Garden of Eden. Yeah. Uh, free of the constraints of human failure, uh, either uh, international conflict and so on, uh, a sort of utopian vision, which I think is very common uh, and very appealing. What's wrong with that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I suppose that the obvious thing wrong with it is just that humans remain, you know, social apes and we're going to, there's no reason to suppose there'll be a discontinuity with history. I suppose also, you know, I remember very early on, my older brother is a constitutional scholar, and I, I, a while back, we ended up not using it, but I, I said something like, well, how would you write the Constitution for Mars if you were, like, going to do that? And his first question, he's like a Tweedy conservative. He said, well, who's going? Uh, which, you know, uh, <laughs> which, you know, nerds tend to think, well, we just need the right people and the right set of rules and no, nothing bad will happen. And he was like, no, they're not going to be discon- discontinuous with the culture. They come with a culture. There's no way to undo it. Um, and so you have to, like humans always have done, exist within these constraints. I would say the, the other thing that should give you pause is, you know, so that, that particular fantasy tends to be either a more libertarian in the, in the American sense or a kind of conservative frontier fantasy. But I have seen it as a, a leftist fantasy. Like, we'll, we'll avoid capitalism uh, when we go to space. And so it should make you pause when space allows every utopia to exist. Uh, <laughs> so at least, at least some percentage is wrong. Um, now, you outline legal issues that confront us if we think about populating space. Mm-hmm. Uh, ethical issues, and uh, much of the book is on the what we might call the physical constraints, technology, uh, and biology of, of human beings. But at the beginning, you talk about the fact that the literature on these questions of how we might move forward – 
tend to be written by people who are biased. You write, yeah. if you're ignorant about space settlement and want to become educated, many of the articles you read, many of the documentaries you'll watch, and pretty much every single book on the topic have been created by an advocate for space settlement. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with advocacy. The space settlement geeks that we've met are smart, thoughtful people, most of them anyway. But reading about space settlement today is kind of like reading about what quantity of beer is safe to drink in a world where all the relevant books are written by breweries. Um, that's fascinating in and of its, it's a great paragraph. Uh, first of all, why is that the case? And uh, of course, some advocates are right, mm -hmm. but you, you're going to suggest in the course of this book that they've missed some of the challenges. Yeah. So as to why it's the case that most of the books are by advocates, um, they, you know, it's, it's very hard to know what people's motivations are. I will say as a popular science writer, there is a kind of ecological aspect to this, which is if you're writing for nerds, which is what most popular scientists do, or at least for curious people or however you want to say it, usually the book is about how you're going to get the thing, right? And so if you're writing, I'm writing a book about, you know, um, AI, usually the book is not why you're not going to get AI. Uh, there, there's just like, I don't know if it's a, a bias towards optimistic takes. I actually had the experience of talking to, partway through the process of talking to a friend who was a fairly well-known pop science uh, author. And he, he actually gasped when I told him we weren't going to say you're going to get space space and space settlement soon. Because it's like, you can't do that. You can't, <laughs> you can't go to the nerds and say, here's the thing you're not going to have. So I think there is just a kind of basic bias. I think it's also just... Space is a persistent fantasy. Uh, if you want to trace it, it's absolutely modern style space fantasies, at least go back to the 19th century. They're kind of like classical precursors, depending on what you want to count. Uh, but it is this sort of like long term adventure fantasy. And it's, it's, it is kind of like the last remaining one that people can consider plausible if they don't know enough about it. Um, and then I would say it's also, and this is what we go through a lot in the book, it is intertwined with many fantasies uh, that, that, that defy political categorization. They're, they're like, you know, westward ho sort of fantasies are all over the place, especially among Americans. But they're also like, we'll save the environment because all the bad stuff can just be in space. And, and like I said, there, there is a small number of people who, my impression is they have a kind of leftist fantasy. There's also, especially in the 70s literature, literature from the 70s, there's a lot of like, uh, fantasies of space is sort of tied to the counterculture. That is to say, we can start 800 new governments and try everything out and learn a better way to exist than we have now. And so I, I, I think it, it's not surprising that in that milieu, a lot of people writing are, are in favor of making it happen. The, the last thing I would say is a lot of people separate from the sort of utopian part are sort of, we, we, we maybe now say like Silicon Valley types, but they used to call themselves Prometheans. Right. Like this is the awesome thing we're going to bring to humanity and you people don't realize how great it's going to be. And so you're going to suffer through, you know, lack of abundance. Um, and so there's this fantasy of kind of bringing the fire to humanity. Um, so, so, so with all that in mind, it's, it's not surprising that a lot of the writers are optimists. Um, yeah. And of course, in the course of writing the book, uh, you inevitably had to talk to people who weren't advocates scientists um, and, and others who remind us of the challenges that are involved. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a stupid person. I, I'm aware there's challenges to space. But I guess, you know, I think part of the reason the, the average person might be a little overly optimistic is that, well, we got to the moon. Mm -hmm. So we'll just go and stay there and we'll build stuff. Yeah. So, um Let's start with the moon and we'll, we'll go into Mars. Uh, they're the two likely places we might choose. And, and I encourage listeners who are, haven't read your book yet uh, just to think, well, yeah, which one would I choose? Well, you know, the moon's closer. Mm -hmm. Mars is more colorful. It seems to be redder, yep. longer trip. You know, it's like, should I go to uh, uh, London or uh, uh uh, Mumbai. Well, London's closer, yeah, et cetera. So you might think about that. And but now, Zach, uh, what? How's it? Is it going to be hard to get settlements on the moon? I mean, it's, it's, we've done it. Yeah, right. We've done it. Um, yeah. So just to give a little context, at least I think we, I think we've done it. Yeah, there are yeah, skeptics, yeah, but start, I'm yeah, pretty sure we've done it. <laughs> yeah. So the thing to know about the Apollo program. So there's this dominant narrative among like. I think just the general population, I don't think historians or legal people share this, but there's this view that uh, 
the moon program, like we took one step up the stairwell and then kind of wimped out and Americans became wimps and we decided not to go back. I think the correct view is more like due to confluence of political factors, a political choice was made to expend a, an extraordinary amount of money making an obviously non-repeatable mission happen on the moon. That was, that was not even that popular among the public if, if, if you look at surveys at the time. Um, and, and so, the, 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 you know, uh, there was an older proposal uh, by Fun Brown, and you hate to like cite a Nazi, an ex-Nazi, but his proposal was at least more sensible. He wanted to build a giant space station with like 80 people, know what we were doing there, then go to the moon in style. I think he would have wanted like a dozen people to go at once with like a lot of scientists. And instead we made this setup where you can send a teeny tiny craft, a lander with two test pilots, like two he-men uh, can just barely make it there. And so there is no infrastructure. There's no attempt to like easily drive down the cost. Um, so the moon is very hard. And a lot of the ways in which it it is hard. We're not tested out on Apollo because I think if you sum up all the time spent on the surface of the moon by humans, it's about 10 days total. Uh, Armstrong and Aldrin walked around for under three hours uh, on, on the moon. And so a lot of the stuff shows up over time. So for example, uh, there are two days night, um, I'm sorry, fortnightly days, fortnightly nights, meaning it's, it's like 14 Earth days of day, 14 Earth days of night. So it gets extraordinarily cold and extraordinarily hot which is, you know, obviously you're going to have to be protected from as a human. It's terrible on equipment. We talked to one guy who said it's, it's hard to even, like, come up with a lubricant that can deal with that for rovers. Um, you're exposed completely to radiation. So in Earth, even the International Space Station is protected by Earth's magnetosphere, which, which blocks or reroutes ionizing radiation. Uh, you don't have that on the moon. The moon obviously has no atmosphere, which means you die very quickly if there's a full pressure loss. Uh, and... Uh, and, and one thing for me is really compelling. So if you see a picture of the moon, and I think this is where a lot of misconception comes from. If you see a picture, it looks okay. But one thing you can't see, for example, is that dust is not like dust anywhere on Earth, right? So there's there's never been water flowing on the moon. There's never been like wind, right? It's just a bare surface that's been smashed by objects from space and radiation for eons. And the result of that is that if you put it under a microscope, it looks like little tiny knives made of stone and glass. Uh, it's called regolith. Uh, there are reasons to believe it's dangerous. Humans haven't had much interaction with it, but at least on, I think on Apollo 17, I want to say Schmidt said like he got an allergic style reaction to it. Uh, and there's, there's speculation that you could get something like what's called stone grinders disease, which just is accumulated lung scarification over time. So it's bad. Um, the, the one other thing I would say, and because for me, this was a big turning point in my perspective, from the perspective of like a settlement, as opposed to sending a couple guys to run around and plant the flag, Moon is very poor in carbon, right? So for, for people who don't remember high school physics and chemistry, uh, carbon is about 20% of your body, uh, more so for most plants. And you can't just get it. It is made in stars, right? You, you can't like spin up a carbon machine. And so the, the joke, I can't remember we put this in the book, but the joke is like, you, you, you'll see articles that say you can grow plants in moon soil. And then if you look at the fine prints, you can grow plants in moon soil if you add nutrients and sunlight and an atmosphere, which is true of anything that is not plant poison. Um, and, and in fact, you can't, the soil is just existing as a substrate. Uh, and there's even evidence that it's a bad substrate, that it stresses the plant. So, you know, essentially what you need to do to survive on the moon is to create a bubble that does not interact with the moon, except to like take in resources and somehow convert them to useful stuff, um, which is extraordinarily difficult. And, 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 and the last thing I want to say, actually, it's, it's nice, you know, we, 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 we really did try to take a kind of economist perspective because you will often hear... Uh, let's say more physics-y types say, well, we can have titanium on the moon. Why? Because there's any amount of titanium on the moon. And, you know, we never talk about Earth this way ever, right? I never say I can have a house because my backyard has silicon for windows and aluminum for metal, you know, and wood is, of course, made of carbon and hydrogen, so I'm all good. Um, and yet somehow this is okay to talk about the moon like this as if no trade-off exists. Um, all of which is to say it's extraordinarily difficult. Yeah, the trade-off being that the fact that it's, quote, there, you have to right. extract it in some way that's vaguely productive, cost-effective, yeah. you know, worth doing. Um, so, yeah, that's very uh, demoralizing. The, the, <laughs> the soil is not pleasant. Uh, the radiation is not pleasant. There's no oxygen. You can't breathe. 
uh, how, how do you, how would you, by the way, I, I don't remember, I, I'm sure you talked about it because it's, you cover pretty much everything. It's, um, at least it felt that way in, in a good way. Yeah. Let listeners know. Um, how, how do I breathe in, in my say moon bubble? I'm going to have to create an artificial, as you point out in a number of places, because the atmosphere itself is so inhospitable to humans, you have to create either a bubble or an underground thing. How do I get oxygen into it and, so, and then into me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You run it in YouTube. Yeah, so um, there are a couple ways. So so right now, the way the ISS works is essentially you have like these oxygen That's tablets. That's the and, International, oh, sorry, Space, International Space, Station. Space Station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, this is the way all space stations have worked. You have a scrubber for carbon dioxide because if carbon dioxide gets above something like 1%, you start getting these really bad headaches and you can get carbon narcosis. It's it's bad. Um so you have a scrubber and then you have like a tablet that just releases oxygen, which which at least in one case was a source of a fire. So it can be a little dangerous. Um, ideally, if you want something that can be a little more permanent, you want to live off the land to the extent you can. So the question is, can you get oxygen on the moon? And the answer is yes, but not easily. They're the best source of oxygen on the moon are what are called the craters of eternal darkness, which are these um, craters near the poles which have such an angle to the sun that there are parts in the rim that never see sunlight, right? So remember, the moon has no atmosphere. So if you spat on the moon, the, the, the spit would just bubble off and be lost forever, right? All that water would be gone. If you, but in these, in these craters, it's locked in the form of ice, so it can't get away. And so the idea is, well, could you go get that? Uh, and the answer is with extraordinary difficulty, you could, uh, right? So it's incredibly cold. It's a lot more like melting a rock than melting <laughs> ice. I mean, you can do it. You can heat it up and melt it. But it's it's in these extremely cold areas. <clears throat> it's also got a lot of nasty volatiles with it. I, I, we list some of them, but like ammonia, stuff you'd have to clean out. The big point, though, and this is a thing I really want to emphasize, there is not that much water. You will regularly see articles in reputable publications that talk about water as if it's like an on-off switch. They have water, they don't on the moon. There is water, it's about as much as a small lake, and it will never replenish, right? If, if you use it up to launch rockets by making propellant out of it, if you lose some to the atmosphere, as you will, if you put it into a gas form to breathe it, it's going to be gone, and there's not that much. So these ideas that we're going to have like a permanent gas station on the moon with rocket propellant, uh, forget about it. it. It will not work. But but yeah, so that's that's how you're going to get yourself oxygen. I think you know, you know. So, so the nice thing about Mars, which we'll get to, is there just is oxygen. You could on the moon, by the way, also bake it out of stone. Like there, there's lots of stone with oxygen in it. But the amount of stone you would have to cook is, is it's on the order of tons just to get your supply per day. So water is extremely scarce. Now, before we go on. I want to ask a general question that I wonder if it crossed your mind. I suspect it did. Um, that last remark of yours is there are many passages in the book like that. You might think this is going to work, but it's not because – and you have many reasons. not just like it's expensive. It's more like it's a tiny amount. It will never replenish and so on. Did you worry it and do you worry that you know many, many technological breakthroughs – were said to be impossible throughout history and you know, human beings will never fly, human beings will never do this, human beings will never do that. And of course, some many of those things we've done that skeptics and scientists of the day thought were impossible. How much time did you spend wondering if there were technological breakthroughs that might make some of these things, you know, phenomenally easier? Yeah, I, I, it's something I think about a lot. Um, and so when you talk to space people, the classic example they'll bring up is aviation. Uh, I actually find in older books, they often bring up steam. Uh, like if you get books from like uh, the 40s or 50s talking about the future of space, like like people thought you'd never get beyond the age of sail and then here's the steamboat, right? And so there, there are, of course, lots of examples. Aviation is a great example because it's so fast, uh, possibly because of warfare. I don't know the historiography, but like you go from, you've ever seen the Wright Flyer, it's amazing that it flew at all. Uh, and then like, a generation later, you have stuff that's recognizably somewhat modern. Uh, and then a generation after that, you have basically today's stuff. And, you know, so I forget the other time, like from the right flare to a supersonic jet is less than a single lifetime, which is insane. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's much lower than that. Anyway, 
Um, so that's brought up a lot. And of course, you don't want to fall afoul of it, but you have to be a little careful with this kind of reasoning because, you know, for me, it's very indicative that the aviation comparison in space books about the incoming imminent future of awesome space stuff, that comparison was being made in the 50s. So in that case, you would have been right if you said it's certainly not coming soon, right? Um, I would say... You know, if, if you wanted, I could list like technologies that, to my mind, would really change a lot of what I'm saying. So, you know, uh, I have friends working at Commonwealth Fusion Systems in Massachusetts. They're trying to make a fusion reactor. Absolutely, if you could just fire up a fusion reactor, it would change a lot. It would not change the equation for water on the moon, but it might change the math for like delivering water from Earth to the moon. Um, and so, but but to me. You know, you, you can, of course, never predict the future. I would actually say a really good example of that is AI now. I mean, none of us know the future, but uh, I don't know if we'll get to this, but one question very briefly that we tried to analyze was, like, what do people think is the minimum number of humans for self-sustaining, like, a settlement that could survive the loss of Earth? The lowest number we found, which I think was pretty fanciful, was 100,000 people. And that was based on the idea that there'll be extraordinary advances in robotics, right? Um, so, so that you would actually have the equivalent of something like 10 million people or more. And I sort of laughed at that when I first saw it in 2018. And I think now maybe, uh, you know, that, that kind of idea is more serious. Robots can now use a little bit of common sense and who knows. Um, but I guess what I want to say is one, of course, I can never predict that. And there've been plenty of people who said, you know, the people who said we'll never have an anti-gravity drive, they were right. Um, <laughs> so there have been plenty of people who just said stuff and they were right. But also, the extent to which a particular scenario requires extraordinary developments kind of tells you something about its nature in that if it requires like 100 butlers per person to go to Mars, then it is not a like Heinlein libertarian frontier fantasy. It's a Star Trek fantasy. It's a future ultra advanced humans making an aesthetic choice to do something really cool like going to Mars. And to be, to be clear, you don't say in the book that humans will never or should never right. populate uh, places outside the earth. You just say many of the semi-optimistic claims yeah. I, th that in the next 10, 20 years we'll do X are not likely. Uh, and more yeah. than that, maybe not even a good idea. Um, let's go to Mars, um, the red planet. Um, we've been there, not with human beings, but with robots, with various uh, pieces of technology. Uh, any better there? Uh, much, much better. I would say we, we are you, Mars. If you are going to try to create a permanent settlement, it's basically Mars or nothing, or Mars or something extraordinarily harder. Uh, so the, the biggest advantage of Mars in general is that Mars has all the stuff you need in a kind of chemical sense, right? So whereas the moon is carbon poor, Mars not only has carbon, its atmosphere is carbon dioxide. It's a very, very thin atmosphere. You can't run around naked outside. Uh, you will die, but um, carbon uh, dioxide, uh, if, if people remember, is uh, CO2. That carbon is quite valuable because you can react it with hydrogen to make methane, which is a good um, flammable gas for like propellants, and oxygen is a popular chemical with humans. Mars also has much more access to water. There's plentiful water at the poles. Uh, most places on the surface, we now think you can dig down far enough and find water. Uh, so... You know, I, I would say on the moon, again, outside of very exotic technology, there is no hope of a permanent settlement that could last if you, the, last through the loss of contact with Earth. Whereas on Mars, it's at least possible. Uh, that said, Mars has most of the problems of the moon, but, but to a lesser degree, right? So like Mars has Earth-like days uh, in terms of, you know, it's, it's a little over 24 hours so that you get a nice regular light dark cycle. Uh, there, there is regolith uh, that is jagged, and actually it's also a little worse because it has perchlorates, which are a hormone disruptor, uh, which will come up again if we talk about the risks to human development in space in the, in the sense of like adolescents being exposed to these chemicals. Um, there's also massive dust storms. So there's this great story that, I forget, maybe it was Mariner 8 or 9, one of the first Mars probes come, you know, sent by the U.S. to go see Mars, and at some point in the journey... Mars, which has a surface, suddenly looks like a flat disk. And it turns out what happened is there was a global dust storm, which is not an irregular occurrence. So you try to imagine what that looks like from the surface, especially if you're using solar panels as your energy source. Uh, kind of terrifying. The other big problem is, and again, without new technology, major new technology, it's six months inbound and six months outbound. 
And there's a period where it's it's not just that you it's six months home; it's that you can't go back because like, Mars is literally racing ahead of you around. Uh, I'm sorry, Earth is racing ahead of Mars around the sun. Right, a, a Mars year is over 600 days. Um, so, like at some point, Earth is literally on the other side of the sun. So, even if you have like your fusion drive and and whatever Star Trek technology, you cannot go home. Um, so it's much more challenging. It's it's the better place ultimately, but it's it's going to be far more challenging given the the distance and all the problems. We well, talk about you mentioned um, regolith, which is uh, these jagged knife like <laughs> dust particles. <laughs> Very pleasant. Yeah. I was going to take a walk with the dog, and I don't think so. Um, and that Mars has hormone disrupting or altering things in their, in its dust, aren't I going to not interact with that at all? Don't I have to be either in a suit or inside a bubble that uh, insulates me from the surface of the planet because I can't breathe? I, I would say basically, yes. Uh, I mean, so yeah, yeah. So the classic picture of a space base involves a giant uh, Buckminster Fuller style geodesic dome, uh, which is almost certainly a bad idea. I mean, the, the obvious upside would be that you get that sunlight um, for like your plants, and uh, but you try to think about, you know, um, so on on Biosphere Two. I don't know if we're going to talk about, but it's like was this experiment where they built a huge enclosed greenhouse, and actually pressure differences inside and outside the glass were a serious problem, and that was on Earth, right? So you you imagine like a, a greenhouse, the inside heats up, so the pressure increases, and there's a concern that you're going to break the glass. On Mars, the internal pressure should be at least something like what we have on Earth, right? Earth pressure outside is basically zero or almost zero. So e that, that greenhouse glass, it's going to have to be really strongly protected, right? So they have windows on the International Space Station, but they're really thick and they have these really strong, um, I guess you'd say window panes. I don't know what the technical term is, but the thing that holds them in place. Uh, so you're not going to have that. You're probably going to live underground uh, because there you're shielded from radiation and temperature swings and other stuff. But you know, so ideally, if you want to be permanent, you do need to interact with the environment in the sense that what you would like to do is incorporate materials from it, right? So, so if you want to be permanent, you know, be able to survive the death of Earth or loss of contact with Earth, you know, you've got to turn that bad soil into soil you could actually use, like part of a little ecology, um, you know. And, and so, unfortunately, we just don't know a lot about this because, you, know, you again, you regularly, regularly you will see an article that's like, we can grow plants in Mars soil. And they will say we, the plant was growing Mars simulant soil. What they don't tell you is Mars simulant soil is like a product that kind of physically simulates Mars soil, but it's not actually chemically much like Mars soil. So it's like it's still an open question uh, what what you need to do and can do on Mars. And I, I worry it won't be answered until like there's a very advanced robots or actual humans there. You spend a entertainingly large amount of time chronicling some of the hijinks. <laughs> of uh, people living in close quarters in <laughs> various space vehicles, space stations, uh, uh, capsules, space capsules from the, from the early days. And although it appears no one's actually killed another person, um, you do talk about some of the psychological challenges of space travel, which I, I'll let you elaborate on it as much as you'd like. But but my first thought when you mentioned living underground in Mars is that, so what's the appeal of this? You know, um, <laughs> am I going to get Netflix and have decent internet so I'll be, on, be able to watch YouTube in my basement? I mean, really, it's not, I mean, when I think about the moon, it's, there is something lovely about the little blue marble that we'd watch from a distance. I mean, actually, it would be quite depressing yeah. to see Earth at that distance over more than, two or three days, it would be horrifying. Worse probably for Mars. The, the nighttime sky would might be lovely, yep. but being underground, I, I don't get it. Why would anyone want to romanticize the idea that you could go live in the basement of a house in a toxic area yeah. where you're not allowed to go outside ever? Where's the, where's the romance? So where's the I, frontier? I say... Where's the westward hoe? You know, uh, the mesas, the, the canyons, the Rockies. It's, it's awful. So I, 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 with the caveat that I totally agree, and I would not be signing up, you, you have to recognize that there is a subset of humanity that 
has trouble even understanding your question. So I, I think of um, you, know, the explorer Bird. I'm forgetting. I'm blanking on his first name. Um, he, he wrote a a book that was famous in the early 20th century called Alone, which was about going close to. I think it was close to the South Pole, and he basically lived down a hole. Uh, and it, it, it got carbon narcosis, almost died. But that was his plan. It was to live down a hole. He was a married man. He was going to live down a hole to get these, like, barometric readings that, you know, saddest of all, I think, 10 years later could have just get, been done with, like, a radio thing. Um, and But for him, that was like, of course I want to live down that hole. This is, you know, I'm doing this great thing for humanity. Or I, I think of, like, uh, Friedhof Nansen, the, the great northern polar explorer, spent, like, two and a half years on a on a boat on the ice, uh, you know, I, mean, I guess he could hunt and, and had friends and stuff, but you know, there, there is a subset of humanity that would be up for this. But I do think the general point there that, you know, people have, you, I, I think of, for example, there's this, this is a stupid example, but I think it's, 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 it's enlightening, which is there's this GIF, this animated GIF file that gets passed around of a guy walking in a suit on the moon and looking at the earth on the horizon. And that's true that you could do that. But later you're going to have to like do the dishes and clean up the toilet and scrub the mold. This is a lot of what happens on the International Space Station. And so people, I think, tend to put the locus of their fantasies on that beautiful moment of Earthrise and forget that they're, you know, in a real settlement, you're there for 60 years, right? And, and most of what you do is, is quotidian. And that's true on the ISS too. Like people on the space station get bored. And so, you know, I... I <laughs> I do think that there is there's a certain appeal for the exploration phase, but eventually you should like if you succeed, I'd say it this way, if you succeed, it should be exactly like Earth, except you're somewhere else, which is kind of boring. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> no, I have to say, though, one of the things that I got from your book uh, was what recent Econ Talk guest Adam Astriani might call a vibe, which was a deep appreciation for the world we live in. I, that was not the purpose of the book. And you mentioned it a couple of times, I think in passing, but mm -hmm. uh, the stark nature of life on Mars or the moon, which is captured in many, many movies, of course, uh, for the people who sometimes return to Earth in those films, that return is so delicious, not just because you're alive, but because it's so colorful and vivid. Um, it does make you uh, appreciate Earth more. And one other movie I'll mention, I'm not going to name it because I mercifully have forgotten the name of it. It's uh, it's Chris Pratt and um, Jennifer Lawrence. I, it's one of the one of the worst movies ever made. But it, in one scene, have you seen that movie? No, I haven't seen it. No, you've been spared. Uh, <laughs> there's a plot twist in it that's so unattractive that you can't help but despise uh, the main character, despite attempts by the script writers to redeem. Him. But um, at the end of that movie, we were, we, without giving away too many uh, aspects of the plot, uh, there's a world that has been created either within this, I think within the spaceship. And it's marvelous. It is just, it's extraordinary. It's, it's like Earth imagined by a, um, a uh, AI image yeah. generator. Uh, you know, it, it's a cross between Tolkien, um, Escher, and uh, I don't know, Van Gogh. It's, it's, it's really magnificent. And the other challenge, of course, is that doing anything productive besides breathing, creating that underground world that you're talking about yeah. is not a straightforward thing. And you talk quite a bit and quite thoughtfully about how making things – very far from Earth is not easy. No, I mean we could we could jump to um, like yeah. So that ecology question is a very deep one, and and I I would say I, just as a nerd, it's like disappointing there's not more work on it because like the idea of creating a sealed ecology that works is just absolutely fascinating as a as a problem. Um, yeah, so I'll give you a really good example. If you go back to the seventies, there was a kind of vogue in the space community for these giant rotating space stations. So like the image you're describing, there were a lot of people have probably seen these like a painting of what looks kind of like a perfect, slightly 1970s bent suburban dinner party next to a beautiful river, except it was down the rim of a toroid. If you've seen an image like that, it's almost certainly from the 70s, it was probably commissioned by a guy named Gerard K. O'Neill, who by the way, knew it was it was bogus. It couldn't possibly be like that. But set that aside. Um, 
one of the promises he and other people would make is, look, you can completely select your ecology in here, right? So if we don't like something, we just leave it out. And in Biosphere 2, they tried to do that. And they failed because it's really hard. So they had cockroaches that ate a bunch of stuff. They had, I think, some kind of mildew that killed a lot of crops, uh, killed all their beans except the ones that were meant for animals that they ended up having to eat. Our favorite was they, they brought in what are called bark scorpions, which are the only lethal scorpion in the United States. Uh, so, so much for Eden. Um, so, you know, there is a kind of hubris aspect uh, to this sort of stuff. There's, there's, there are these ideas that are like, well, if we could do it, wouldn't it be great? And the problem is it's just really hard to control ecology. Um, you know, like I give lots of examples from that story. They, they, one of my favorite stories, just an example of how, how silly this can go. I can't remember if we put this in the book, but they were actually poisoning themselves for a while because they were eating raw taro. Yeah. And they had to actually call... A guy knew a guy in Puerto Rico because, you know, this is like pre-internet and like in Puerto Rico, they actually eat this stuff. So they were able to get recipes. You know, that's how basic it can be. Let's talk about some of the other problems because uh, they're really interesting, even if they're discouraging. Um, I found this part fascinating and it um, it's just absurd. Uh, the environment of space also, this is a quote from the book, the... Um, the environment of space also reportedly makes food taste less flavorful. This may be a result of the fluid shift, creating sinus pressure similar to a cold, or maybe that in zero gravity smells don't waft up to, into your nose, or maybe something about the artificial atmosphere. Whatever the reason, astronauts often lust for piquant condiments, piquant condiments such as salt, pepper, Tabasco, and mayonnaise, and of course, Taco sauce, salty, uh, zesty yes. taco sauce is so beloved by astronauts that for about a week in 1991, it became the first form of currency specific to outer space. On shuttle flights STS-40, taco sauce went on everything. Pilot Sid Gutierrez recalled, although I didn't do it myself, I observed crewmates putting taco sauce on Rice Krispies in the morning. Around day eight, STS 40's commander Brian O'Connor realized the crew's rate of taco sauce consumption would soon outstrip the taco sauce supply. According to Gutierrez, the commander secured all the remaining taco sauce, divided it equally among the crew members. Thereafter, taco sauce became the medium of exchange. For example, if it was your turn to clean the latrine, you could pay someone a taco sauce or two to do it for you. End of quote, uh, brought a little economics into the, into the conversation. The currency of exchange was taco sauce. This is insane. <laughs> I, I, I love that story. You know, well, it was something we tried really hard to do. So like there are a lot of space stories that have been told many times and we didn't want to tell that we wanted to find new stuff. And so a lot of it was reading oral history. And I remember that book is in an oral history of the space shuttle where they just interviewed tons of astronauts and they kind of binned the interviews helpfully into like, this is stuff that was said about food. This is stuff that was said about wonder. And I just love that story because it's so, it, it, it captures the quotidianness of space so thoroughly, you know, and, and, but also tells you about like, you know, it is true that apparently space food doesn't taste as good. Something happens. We don't understand it super well. Um, but yeah, I love, like, I, I, I've told that story to many economists and they're always just delighted by it, by the idea that like humans just spontaneously created currency. Uh, and, and, and by the way, that wouldn't have been, I don't know how long it was, but it would have been like under two weeks, that trip, like humans very quickly, uh, created economies. <laughs> well, not just very quickly created currency, uh, taco sauce, uh, became that, that is what is actually almost as interesting to me is that taco sauce became the currency. The way tobacco or cigarettes were in prisoner war camps that right. we've talked about on this program. Uh, we don't get to reference that classic Mike Munger episode often enough, so uh, we'll put a link to that uh, in the archives. Uh, the loss of tasty food is uh, the least of it. Uh, let's talk about issues related to um, uh, radiation and uh, bone mass and muscles, yeah. which I think most people, it doesn't cross their minds. Yeah, so um, never cross mine. The, the, the first thing I would like to note that is that I, I, I'll, I will shortly rattle off a bunch of bad stuff space does to you. The longest an individual has ever been consecutively in space is 437 days, about a year and a third, right? Um, so all this bad stuff is in the context of a very short period of time. So space reliably degrades muscle density, 
uh, especially in areas of your body you just don't use in space, like your hips don't really come up in space, you can lose. And in, in one paper, they found 1.5% density loss per month, per month. Insane. You can get uh, renal stones because you're, you're, so much calcium is coming out of your system. Like, like this is what your body does. When you don't use stuff, it goes away. It's very similar to people who are stuck in bed for a long period of time. Uh, and that is with a, a huge amount of exercise, strength training, that sort of stuff. Similar effects happen to muscles. Uh, people lose a lot of strength. Um, it was a story that Jerry Leninger uh, was an astronaut uh, who went aboard Mir, the big Soviet space station, later a Russian space station. He was very proud that after, I think, something like four and a half months aboard, he was able to walk when he came out, just walk. Uh, by himself, right, right, and so most people don't. Uh, the the Soviet tradition was actually that people would be carried out like uh, the bride over the vestibule, uh, out of the capsule, um, and so it, you know, space degrades muscles, degrades bones. There's more subtle effects when you go to space. There's a fluid shift shift upward, right? So your body's plumbing is used to fighting gravity. When you go up into space fluid just shifts up. People get what's called puffy face. If you see astronauts shortly after they've gone to space, they often kind of look baby faced. Uh, and it's because this fluid is shifted up and they often have to urinate a lot because of that, because it throws off what their body thinks is going on with their, uh, fluids. And, and so typically when astronauts are about to land, they drink something like consomme or like, like thick Gatorade, uh, to restore this fluid balance. That fluid shift, we think, also degrades vision. So astronauts, especially if they're like my age or older, like in their 40s, they are ten. They send they send them up with what is the acronym is SAG S A G. Uh, it's something like space adjustment goggles or something. But basically, reliably, your vision gets worse, and we think that's because something with the fluid shift is like changing how the nerves to your eyes get fed or something. But it's a little <laughs> ominous because there is equivocal evidence, possibly of cognitive effects. Uh, and so it could be that, that that vision effect is just more obvious than, than uh, cognitive effects. We don't know, but it's a little creepy. Um, and then, of course, there's radiation. The, the basic deal on radiation is we don't understand well what it does, but the assumption is that it's bad, and, and in particular that it's bad for a, an increased cancer risk. But the connection is very poorly understood uh, because it's very hard to study radiation in humans, and even if you have data on radiation on humans, uh, it doesn't necessarily apply in space because it's a different type of radiation. Now, the book is about space settlement, not space travel per se. Um, we we could almost certainly put a human being on Mars sooner than later if we if we worked at it. Yeah. But the question is, could Mars be an escape hatch or alternative reality, alternative place for human beings if either a, a nuclear war of unimaginable size happened here, or climate change got to the point where it was no longer friendly to human life and could we survive by um going to to say mars uh, you earlier mentioned we need a hundred thousand people part of the reason is that uh you want to reduce inbreeding uh and yeah. you want to reduce uh you want to be able to have um subsequent generations and you know in my mind okay you know uh, may, maybe you send uh among your astronauts who who head to to mars uh, there'd be a mix of of men and women. They would procreate either before, during, or after, and your population would start to grow. And it's forgetting the hundred thousand sort of minimum, if that actually is accurate. And you actually think it's larger. Mm -hmm. um, what's the challenge of pregnancy and um, and yeah. growing up uh, outside the friendly Earth that we grew up on? Yeah, so the short version is we know almost nothing, and what we do know is scary. And so uh, the 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 deal is so one thing we talk about, which I don't think we're going to get into here, but is that human spacefaring like is expensive. It is usually done for political reasons. Nations do it to kind of demonstrate prestige. Uh, the scientific uh, rewards are kind of questionable. Um, and so the result of that is there's not like a systemic program aboard these space stations to learn how animal reproduction works, right? So you can imagine a world where NASA was like the space settlement agency and someone would say, we need a space station just to steady reproduction. That has not happened. It's very grab baggy. So when we tried to collect like every experiment involving like gametes or reproduction or anything even vaguely related to reproduction, you know, it, it's just a bunch of random stuff. It's like one group in the 80s sent up quail eggs and a group in the 90s sent up a rat to see how it felt and, and measured some hormones. 
And so it's extremely unsystematic. And so the result of that is you basically can't conclude anything for sure. And 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 just to be clear, no one has ever uh, tried to conceive in space that we know of. Um, and uh, certainly if they did, there's no science done on it. Um, so that's the, the the level of not knowing we have. Then why it's scary? Well, of course, there's the radiation. Uh, as, as I said, microgravity reliably re reduces bone density. Micro so, microgravity being whatever level of gravity there is, say, on the trip. Yeah, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, effectively no gravity. Uh, we, we, the, the term is microgravity, but you can just say zero gravity, right? So yeah, on the trip, there'd be zero gravity. In the International Space Station, there's zero gravity. You know, logically, we're going to be on the moon or Mars, so there'll be some gravity. We have no idea what the long-term effect on bones, you know, so there's, there's some world in which 40% gravity on Mars is enough to fix everything. Or maybe 40% gravity and you wear like a weighted vest or something. Man, maybe it'll be fine, right? I, I, do, I do like the point, you know, so we're worried. It's worth noting that like in the 50s, it was an open question whether humans could eat, you know, in space. There was a concern that you might like, you know, it, it's frankly, I still find it surprising people can eat with no gravity. Um and so it's possible that bone density stuff on the moon or Mars will be fine. But, you know, you try to imagine having an infant, with, an infant without the normal pull of gravity. It's just zany. And the other thing is, you know, usually when we talk about this question, uh, we, usually people will say something like, can you have babies in space? There's an anthropologist named Cameron Smith who wrote a book called Space Anthropology. And we don't agree with everything he says, but he, he made a really good point, which is it won't do to just talk about babies because the babies have to grow up to have babies. So if you, if you have successfully have a kid, which I'm willing to buy you, could do in space with all the constraints, they have to develop normally, right? So you imagine like their gametes exposed to radiation and whatever mysterious effects of microgravity there are beyond that one and a third year threshold that we don't know about or whatever else. You know, you try to imagine that telescoping gen generations, like it's, it's, there's no way to know. And the important thing to us is it's, it's not just that we don't know. It's like, it's obviously unethical to just send a thousand humans and assume they're going to reproduce on Mars. It's basically, you know, I am, I am enough of a libertarian to think if a human adult signs a waiver, they can throw their life away however they like. But if they're going to introduce children into it who did not volunteer to grow up in this incredibly hostile, dangerous environment, that seems to me pretty clearly like experimenting on children for no good reason. Um, <laughs> yeah. So sorry, it ended up kind of dark, but, um, but yeah, we don't know much. And what we know is frightening. Well, I think the most exciting thing I think we've heard so far is that uh, rucking, that is the use of uh, a, a backpack or weighted vest to help uh, mus musculature and bones stay strong, will be very popular on uh, on Mars, and that that will please I think recent some recent econ talk guests and many of our listeners. Um, let's turn to the question of where you started in this book, which we've yet to mention. You, yeah. you make a list of reasons that people might want to go to outer space um, and populate faraway places. Uh, the two you mentioned are the cathedral and the hot tub. Mm -hmm. So tell us uh, what those are and uh, tell us how you think your expanded knowledge of the realities affects those motivations? Yeah, so, so, so in the beginning of the book, we, we basically just try to say a bunch of the stuff you've heard is wrong, like space is probably not going to make us rich or save the environment very soon anyway, or any of this stuff. So we say, what arguments seem plausible to us? And one we call uh, the cathedral of survival, the idea being like, okay, maybe space, going to settle space won't do anything for us, like, you know, sparing us from climate change or whatever. But it would be a good thing to do, say, in the next few centuries, because it would help preserve the species, uh, which, which, you know, there, there are philosophical arguments about this, but basically most people agree that having humans continue as a species would be objectively, ethically good. And so the idea is then, well, regardless of return on investment or whatever, you know, people like these wiener smiths think we should be worried about, we should start putting in pieces now so that our descendants um, can have this better chance to survive. So that's one argument that, that at least is superficially plausible. The other argument we call the hot tub argument, which is just, you know, I think th this came up when we talked to space geeks, they would often start with these kind of highfalutin philosophical things about like, you know, well, we need to revitalize society and, and, and save the environment and end and, and poverty. And then eventually if you, if you kept talking, they would say something like, 
well, whatever, uh, Elon Musk has the money in the Rockets and we're going to go and and you have no sort of standing to stop us, right? There's like, so, you know, even if there's no good reason to do it, we want to do it. And the reason we say hot tub is kind of a joke. It's like, well, if you go to buy a hot tub, all that matters is that you want it and someone is willing to sell it and you can make that transaction. And generally speaking, there's, you know, some third party can wag their finger, but it's none of their business. And the the way we like to talk about that is that's true of most transactions, I would think. You know, like if you go to the grocery store, there's not a third party saying, do you really need those Oreos? Maybe you like your spouse, um, but like, <laughs> but, but, but nobody else. Um, whereas there are some categories of purchase we don't say that about. A classic example is nuclear weapons. So I actually looked it up. Even like the, the, the you know, Mises.org doesn't think private citizens should be allowed to have nuclear weapons, right? So even, I, I, I was wondering if there is, is there someone who is okay with private citizens building hydrogen bombs. And even they are like, no, because that's effectively waving a gun at everybody in the in the state, uh, which violates uh, non-aggression, right? And so there's, there's essentially no one who is okay with that. There's probably somebody, but basically nobody. And then you can imagine the spectrum from like going to buy a hot tub, which basically has no third party with any right to say no, and buying a nuclear weapon where essentially everybody should be able to say no. And then the question becomes, where does space settlement fall on that axis? And you might think, why, why is it not a pure aesthetic choice? Well, try to imagine, as some people have proposed, putting a million tons of metal uh, about 70 miles high in orbit. Um, I think most of us feel like we should have a say whether anyone is allowed to just do that uh, because, it, it, oops, sorry. because it creates this huge hazard not dissimilar from the hazard of, of detonating nuclear weapons. And then so like a lot of the book is kind of sussing out how valid are these seemingly valid arguments? And our ultimate conclusion is that the hot tub argument clearly won't do. It's not a simple personal choice because basically, even if you imagine, you know, fusion drives and whatever else, having a world where private actors can put enormous amounts of high speed metal in space is, is a world where human humanity is endangered. Uh, so it seems like there just has to be um, some kind of regulatory framework uh, and we, you, you know, you can argue about what that should look like, but there has to be some kind of control on it for the same reason there has to be on nuclear weapons. As for the multi-planetary aspects, that we're a bit more sanguine about, though we do want to note there's a scholar named Daniel Dudney who I think fairly convincingly argued, and we're, we're not quite as pessimistic, but said, look, um, you know, going multi-planetary multi-planetary carries these risks, one of causing a kind of a war on Earth just over like turf scrambles. And there's an argument that that could happen is, is even kind of already a little bit happening on the moon. Uh, but also, you know, war between planets could be extraordinarily bad. And, and without getting into it, the point is, if you have a, an equation that says existential risk, there's the tendency to say an extra planet is, a, is, is, is definitely a net positive period because it's just uh, the, the common metaphor is don't put all your eggs in one basket. But there, there is some world in which doing all this increases uh, existential risk, uh, possibly more than is offset by being multiplanetary. So it's, 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 an, it's quite complicated. I think you're quite fair to the hot tub argument, not, not because of the, the economics, but I, I think it's the economics meaning of externalities and whether you know, it re should reduce your right to do what you want. Um, there is something... I think about the human aspiration to do what can be done, even if it shouldn't be done. AI is a perfect example. I think we're going to have a really hard time holding it back. Um, most things that people think of happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Elon Musk will probably, if he lives, will probably go to Mars. Maybe not himself personally, but I could imagine he would. Um, and to me, there's something powerful and, and poignant about our desire on our little tiny planet in the middle of a, an enormously large galaxy to take a very, very small step. <laughs> yeah. uh, not, not, not for human beings, meaning to be on the moon, but to actually start to go farther. Mars would be next. And then wh whether we could ever go beyond that in any reliable way is a technological question at, at, at a minimum. Uh, but there's something... Even though I, I, it doesn't – I'm not sure how compelling the argument is. There is something um, uh, moving about it, even if yeah. I'm not convinced by it. Yeah. <clears throat> so two things on that. Um, so 
Uh, one, I agree. I can't remember who first said it. Maybe it was Sagan, but I have a feeling it was earlier. Said essentially like the difference between going to space and not is the difference between zero and infinity, right? It's like if we start expanding eventually at some distant date, some descendant of human intellect is throughout the galaxy, right? Uh, you know, I mean, that's a very distant, very, very, very distant day. But, you know, the alternative is we just stay home and that's it. And eventually the sun engulfs us and, and it is no more. Um, so um, I think that's true. Uh, I do think you have to reckon with the idea that it might be better to wait for the simple reason that we might be more likely now to cause species destruction than we might be in 100 years. There's no way to know. Uh, you know, could, could, some people make what's called a short window argument, like actually we're, we're right the second in a kind of golden age, so we have to go now before we sort of lose the juice. Uh, Robert Zubrin makes an argument that's essentially like, Americans are still a little tough from the frontier days, so we, can, we should go now while, while we're still tough, uh, which I don't buy, but, but I think a lot of people buy some version of it. Um, the other thing I would say, I'm not sure it's the case that humans always eventually get what they want. I mean, the obvious example would be nuclear power. We have, we have kind of, True. I was going to say made a collective decision, but it's more like, you know, made a collective sort of stumble uh, towards basically saying we're not going to do it en masse like people had imagined in the 50s, right? True. Um, but I haven't actually, for, for space, there's an even better example. And I, I promise I won't get in the weeds on this, but very quickly... In Antarctica, there was a, an attempt in the late 80s to say we, could, we we want to make a framework. So Antarctica is regulated as a commons by a consortium of nations, right? Nobody owns it. Nobody, you know, it belongs to a bunch of nations, right? There was a, a move to make it exploitable. And there was evidence, I understand, from survey data that, like, maybe there were actually economically viable resources to get in Antarctica. And a very standard space geek argument is... Well, you guys can talk about regulation and danger all you want, but the moment there's money to be made in space, people are going to just go get it and whatever. All the international law is going to go away because there's money to be made. Well, in Antarctica, there probably was money to be made. And when it came time to make rules saying you could go get stuff, there was such an outcry uh, that in, I think, 1998, a protocol was put into place saying you not only can you not exploit Antarctic resources, you can't even look. Uh, it, it's like an open question, like it gets dicey, like are geologists technically looking for resources? And there's a moratorium that lasts till 2048, and it cannot be lifted outside of unanimous consent by, I, I forget how many nations now, but it's something like uh, 30. And so humans have at least some capacity to say, no, I don't want the thing, it scares me too much. And so I, I, I'm, I don't completely buy the idea that we'll just eventually do something because it's awesome or lucrative enough. Uh, obviously, this is an interesting question now with AI, uh, and uh, so and I, none of us know how that's going to shake out. Where does that leave us? Um, you've convinced me that we're not going to have a um, an NFL exhibition game on Mars uh, in, the, in the next ten or twenty years, or even better, a franchise. Um, that underground stadium is going to be really awesome, though, I'm sure. That's cool. So you convinced me of that. But should we – what should be our – what is your recommended attitude that human beings should have toward these uh, constraints? Should we gather information, say, about radiation damage, uh, muscle, muscle, muscle loss, bone loss, hormone imbalance adjustments in space travel of, you know, the time it takes to get to Mars and so on? Uh, or should we just wait uh, until technology makes a lot of this more plausible? Right. Where do you come um, down on that? Uh, I don't, I don't want to get too parsing your question, but when you say humanity should... I, I get a little, I, it gets a little dicey, right? Because so people, when they talk about space, tend to talk about Earth as if it's in any way unified about questions like this. Um, and so I, I don't want I, 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 to try to answer the sort of spirit of your question. Um, you know, uh, obviously it's, it's this deep fantasy. Uh, you know, so one of the things we did as a research for this book is just got every book we could put our hands on, which was someone from the past saying we need to go to space. And the kind of modern version of that, you probably you'd say starts in like the 1890s with a guy named Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, sort of founder of rocketry. And it, it just pretty much every decade you can find more, more of this fantasy. So there's obviously something it's doing for us. Whereas, you know, uh, Antarctic fantasies, maybe a, a, a kid in 1910 was still thinking about it, but it's kind of old news now. 
Um, and so there is something deep about it. I mean, my view is essentially if you want there to someday be creatures that look like you, you know, human beings on these other worlds, and, and if, if what you really want is Star Trek, meaning, you know, we, you know, uh, we, we, we go out to the stars and we explore things and it's awesome. Um, I don't know about what humanity should do. I would say there's a lot of really interesting stuff for a, a human to do. So, for example, like, like as we said, we, we know very little about reproduction, uh, and nobody seems willing to spend on it, including the people with the billions of dollars it would take. And that would be such an extraordinarily amazing question to try to answer. Uh, it would require probably building a moon base and populating it. Um, these ecosystems that we need to develop, these closed loop ecologies, like that just seems to me objectively fascinating. Like what is the minimum size of container you need to build a little tiny sort of Eden that can feed people? Uh, that's just a, a, a delightful question. Uh, they, they probably would have utility too for, you know, um, just regular people on earth trying to grow food. Um, one thing that, that surprises me now I'm surprised there aren't more young people wanting to go into international law. It's considered kind of stuffy, but it's like one of these few areas where you can be scribbling ideas on a piece of paper and 20 years later it shapes uh, the way like an entire world is is uh, has its property regime. I mean, it's kind of amazing, if you, you know, and again, without getting into the weeds, like we have this framework for international law called the Common Heritage of Mankind, and it, it ultimately goes back to a speech by a single person given at the UN, you know, the, the, you, you can really shape the world by being a scholar, which is very unusual. <laughs> um, so in terms of what needs to be done, you know, we, we obviously need much better science. We do need the kind of cool engineering stuff, the scaling of our ability to do rocketry, which SpaceX and other companies are now working on. We also, I think, and this is obviously a tall order, and I understand that we, we need a more harmonious Earth, um, you know, in the same way that... Uh, you know, war in, in, in Western Europe is, is, I think, unthinkable now. It would be nice if the whole world was, was more like that, and then it would be safer to allow people to put these large objects in space. Uh, I think you know, it's still debatable, but, um, but all these things. And then I think at that point, ultimately, it is an aesthetic choice, right? Um, like the, the people in Star Trek are going to space not to get rich, because that doesn't make any sense. Space is the same everywhere, right? You're not going to get rich by getting stuff from Mars because it's made of the same stuff you have back home. Right. You, you have to go there as an adventure. And so you need to get to a world where the technology is there and it is possible to not increase human existential risk by, you know, going to 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 have that adventure. My guest today has been Zach Wienersmith. His book written with his wife, Kelly Wienersmith, is A City on Mars. Zach, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. This is a delight. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>